This is the For Virginia podcast. Tonight, we cover the dumpster fire known as the Trump campaign and bring you news from around the state. Let's get started. Well, we hope everyone has enjoyed the past two weeks. We sure have, dealing with Hurricane Matthew and just the Trumpster fire that has been going on in the nation the past couple weeks. We are going to break with form and talk about the election. There's just too much stuff going on these coming weeks up to the election that we can ignore We've been trying to. We're a state pack, but we cannot. There's just so much stuff going on in the state of Virginia that ties to this federal election that we can't ignore. We can't not talk about it. So I'm calling Uncle. We're going to go with it. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. This is the For Virginia podcast for the week ending October 15th, 2016, show number nine. I'm your host, Michael Brandon Way. Thanks for tuning in. For Virginia is a Virginia State Political Action Committee focused on supporting progressive causes and candidates at the local and state level, normally. Our local... Our weekly podcast is meant to provide you with news and analysis of politics news across the state, helping you get the information you need to be an informed citizen, battle right-wing propaganda, and to help help progressives organize and activate where we are most needed. And, And right now, it's all across the state. The Donald Trump campaign is in complete disarray. We have so much back and forth going on Facebook and social media about rape culture, sexual abuse, WikiLeaks emails. It's all over the place. And we've gotten in some heated discussions with people over the past couple weeks. And we're not going to try and and shy away from it, at least through Election Day. I, I don't see how we can. It'd be a disservice to you our listeners and and our friends. So we're going to get into it. Um, As always, we'd like to ask you to go to our website at forvirginia.org where we'll be posting show notes with links to all the sources that we reference from the show. Please share the podcast on social media. Follow us on Facebook and help get the word out about it. We'd like uh, to hear any feedback on the show. Um, We've been pushing the show out on YouTube for the past, uh, since we started, you know, eight, nine weeks ago. And, uh, you know, if there's a, a better way that, or a different way that you'd like us to put things out there, um, we were thinking about SoundCloud, um, Apple iTunes podcasts. I don't know what people are using, but if you have whatever's most convenient for you that it will help you uh, be more convenient for you to listen to the show and share it with your friends, please let us know. We're uh, totally open. Um, another housekeeping note, we had to cut off signups on the webpage. Uh, did a little bit of messing around with the uh, CAPTCHAs, if you know what those are. Uh, trying to keep some of these spam emails. We get so many spam signups, rather, all the time, and usually have to go through there and delete like 10 or 15 spam signups for every one legitimate person that wants to have an account. And I, I made some changes a few weeks before we went on break, and I got back and checked it the other day, and there was there was just hundreds of them. So I just had to call Uncle, just cut it off. And uh, we'll we'll fix that and figure that out. If you would like an account to comment on something, uh, let me know on Facebook or through the YouTube. Leave a comment on one of the videos, and um, we'll get that open for you. But, I mean, you want to talk about Cybersecurity Month in October. You know, I guess you could consider we've been uh, denied of service or DOSed um, because I can't, I can't keep up with it. So... As usual, we're going to start with uh, old news follow-ups from previous stories this week. Starting with the Virginia budget deficit, Governor McAuliffe has called for pay cuts, job freezes, and reconsideration of Medicaid expansion. 
to deal with the state's $1.5 billion budget shortfall, promising no cuts to public education, but he has promised to cut 26 jobs, mostly at the Virginia Library. They're eliminating 300 vacant positions. He's going to deal with the budget in December. He's also going to persuade, or attempt to persuade rather, the General Assembly to approve Medicaid expansion, which he believes will free up $211 million a year in state money spent on mental health care and hospital care for the uninsured. Fat chance. Fat chance. Um, what did we, we missed it by one vote last year. Uh, I believe that's through the Senate. I'm not sure. I'll, if somebody knows, get in touch with me. I, I usually do my homework, but I don't want to say something false. So I know it didn't make it through the Senate because it was a one vote off. There was a retirement, a controversial retirement, uh, because a Democrat stepped down to apparently give his daughter a job with some think tank or some other corporation or state office or, or something along those lines. It was it was pretty cowardly because uh, we would have had the vote that we needed. But I'm not sure if the Senate and the House would have had to have cleared that. I believe it's, it's a bill, so that probably would have been lost in the House anyways. But don't quote me on that because I'm not 100%. A couple other items about the Medicaid expansion. Uh, Daily Press, Travis Fain's article, Medicaid drives budget but not up as much as GOP says. And th this probably goes back to what we've seen a lot of where the main argument the GOP has against Medicaid expansion is the cost associated with it. And as with most statistics, it's probably very easy to, to game these numbers as, uh, how you want. And I, I probably won't get too far into the, the article about what's going on. So the Speaker of the House, William Stafford, claimed that Medicaid spend, spending increased 96% in 10 years. And the reason it's incorrect is because it wasn't Medicaid expansion costing 96% more. It was that the increase in the budget over that time was due to Medicaid expansion. So... Again, not to get into the weeds here, but when you hear a Republican talk about the cost of Medicaid expansion, the thing you have to remember is not that Medicaid costs more. It's how you compare it to states that didn't expand it. So Medicaid expansion, health care costs in general are going to go up, period. We've got some 30,000-odd baby boomers retiring a day. I'm about to pull those figures up. Don't quote me on that. But the population is aging, and we're going to be spending more and more and more and more on health care, especially if we're paying $300 for EpiPens, but that's another story. So health care costs are going up. This was one of the main reasons why we fought the Obamacare fight. And when you hear someone argue against Medicaid expansion because health care costs are going to rise, you have to point out that states that expanded Medicare had costs rise less than states that didn't. So it's not that expanding Medicaid is going to increase the budget. The budget is going to increase. The costs are going to increase regardless. The question is, do we want to continue to have a segment of the population that can't get health care, can't get dental care, that are can't afford Obamacare or premium raises and, and so forth. Is that the kind of society that we want to be? And I don't think it is. Next item, old news. To Michael Mitchell's death. Hampton Ridge Regional Jail. Editorial in Virginia Pilot. Still awaiting answers. Two reports have come out from the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services and another by the Office of the State Inspector General trying to explain how a 24-year-old arrested for stealing $5 worth of snacks from a convenience store was kept in a cell for more than three months, never received a court-ordered evaluation, and died in a cell after losing 40 pounds in 40 days. New leadership at the jail. Old boss, same as the new boss. I don't know. 
But don't let anyone claim to you that this was a one-time thing. Not only did Michael Mitchell, Henry Stewart, Mark Goodrum, other people whose names we don't know because of privacy laws, mental health, incarceration, and accountability in the state of Virginia leaves a lot to be desired. Next item, Richmond's mayoral race. Last we talked about it, Joe Morrissey, controversial candidate, the Donald Trump of Virginia, was in the lead in this multi-candidate race. Uh, Things have uh, deteriorated, as you would probably expect. Uh, Most recent news we wanted to talk about, Joe Morrissey's campaign manager claimed that if Morrissey was elected, he would become the first real, excuse me, the, quote, real first black mayor of Richmond. Um, Deborah Rep, his campaign manager, said she was taken out of context trying to invoke the comments of Toni Morrison about Bill Clinton being the black, first black president. Uh, an editorial in the Richmond Times goes to point out that a man named Henry Marsh was Richmond's first black mayor in 1977, a man who devoted his career to civil rights and who served as a sort of predecessor to Virginia's first black governor, Doug Wilder. There was also a, if you don't know about Morrissey, it's a long convoluted story. We've covered it before. To recap quickly, he was disbarred uh, for, not to mince words, lying, unethical behavior. So he was disbarred. I don't have the circumstances regarding the, the first disbarment handy. But he was disbarred and then sued to get reinstated, and the Virginia Supreme Court reinstated him. Um, He was running as delegate, excuse me, he was a standing House of Delegates member and decided to run for State Senate? Back that up. So he was a standing delegate, and he was arrested and imprisoned, actually. He actually went to jail for circumstances surrounding possession of underage sex that were of one of his underage female staffers. Morrissey's uh, claimed that it was the woman's ex-boyfriend that set him up, basically, and he went he, d- he pled down to some misdemeanor charge, did several months in jail, but during, during the time of this controversy, he was forced to resign by the Democratic leadership, which triggered a special election, which he entered as an independent. He ran for re-election from jail and was re-elected in the special election. So now he's running for mayor of Richmond, and he is the leader of the pack, so to speak. And so this attack ad came out earlier this month from one of his opponents. And I'll play for you right here. Here This is Michelle Mosby, city council president, business owner, candidate for mayor, but most importantly, a mom. Black mothers and fathers, listen to me. See Joe Morrissey for who he is. Think about how he benefits from the prosecuting and the defense of our black people. Joe says he'll fight for you if you pay his huge fees. Joe's the 57-year-old boss who claimed innocence but took an Alfred plea for having sex with his employee, a 17-year-old black girl, then lied about it to keep himself out of jail. And to top it off, Joe has been a delegate in the General Assembly for eight years with no laws passed to help our black community with education or workforce. Joe's been taking advantage of us for far too long. I wouldn't trust Joe Morrissey with my daughter, and I'm asking you not to trust him with our city. I'm Michelle Mosby, and I'm working for you. I'll be a mayor your daughters and sons will be proud of. I'm Michelle Mosby, candidate for mayor, and this ad was paid for and authorized by Mosby for mayor. 
So that ad was from Richmond City Council President Michelle Mosby against former Delegate Joseph Morrissey. Former. Um, She's running for mayor as well. Wouldn't trust Joe with my daughter, let alone mayor of Richmond. I don't know what to say. (laughs) Seriously. And to wrap up old news uh, real quick, the Petersburg City Council... Sorry, I just blanked out reading this. The City Council of Petersburg, which is currently in a multi-million dollar budget shortfall, 12 million shortfall, 18 million in bills, has decided to spend a quarter million dollars during this financial crisis to enter into emergency negotiations with the Robert C. Bob Group which is a financial consulting company run by Robert Bob, who was a former Richmond City manager who also served as emergency financial manager of Detroit Public Schools. So this was a five-to-one vote of the Petersburg City Council. The company specializes in addressing urban populations Partnerships with D.C., New Orleans, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Oakland, California, etc. will cost more than $300,000. We've talked about Petersburg before. They had to stop maintenance on city vehicles. They were talking about closing down a fire department, which didn't happen. Um, they're in, they're in tough news, and this kind of goes back to, you know, we've been talking about this regularly on this show about the state budget shorts falls. So it's not just Petersburg that, that's having this problem. And there's a Washington Post article to which I'll quote, Petersburg, Virginia is in dire straits. High poverty and population decline have limited the city's tax base. More on that later with the amendments to the Constitution. Absence of strong fiscal and financial policies left it unable to pay its bills. To avoid insolvency, municipal leaders have had to take unpopular but necessary action, cutting public services and raising taxes. Although the depth and immediacy of Petersburg, Petersburg's fiscal problems are unique, what ails it mirrors similar crises in hundreds of cities across the United States. 300 cities with a population of at least 40,000 and others like Petersburg that are slightly smaller have struggled to recover from the Great Recession. Some of these cities still still wield significant economic strength but remain beleaguered by entrenched poverty. And then he goes on to offer a new way of doing things. The author, David Eichenthal, is a managing director with someone called the PFM Group who apparently consulted with the Petersburg City Council. He, he talks about proposing certain measures to the Petersburg City Council and they go into a lot of mm, corporate speak about innovative strategies to build operational capacity, foster collaboration among stakeholders and boost competitiveness to produce economic benefits. Talking about results in Providence, Rhode Island. um, I'll put the link in the notes there so you can read over it. But I keep pointing it out, Petersburg is... I guess sort of the canary in the coal mine, at least here in Virginia. There were other states that we've talked about in the past. Excuse me, other cities. Hopewell was one that we mentioned before. Um, you know, the, the state budget is a mess. I, I've talked about US 460 and the almost $200 million that was just lit on fire with regards to that project. And we talked a little bit about the Redskin Stadium trying to bring that to Virginia and uh, you know if you don't if you haven't heard John Oliver's rant about NFL stadiums and public funds then I encourage you to, to go out and listen to that there's a lot of reasons why these city councils and mayors try to create these incentives and tax breaks for these billionaire football owners to come in and, and plop a team down and 
it just doesn't pay off. And, and Virginia Beach has been going through the same thing. They're trying to build a stadium out there that they hope will, you know, encourage the NCAA tournament and so forth to come out and maybe bring a, a sports team to the area. But, you know, we've, we've been dealing with a, a large budget surplus over the past few years of McCall's administration. Not so sure about McDonald's, but cities like Petersburg are hurting. And we got we to gotta be aware of what's going on with them because it's not going to be just Petersburg. There's going to be other cities that are having these problems. I mean, hell, probably half of the rural areas in the western part of the state are have been like this already. And, you know, we talked to Max, Matt Skeens a few weeks ago, about two months maybe, and heard about, you know, the health care issues over there and just the abject poverty that, that has followed the decline of the coal industry out there. A lot of stuff to be aware of. We're going to take a real quick break. We'll be right back. This is the For Virginia Podcast. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the For Virginia Podcast. My name is Mike Way. We're going to move on to new items for this week. The Virginia Tourism Department is targeting LGBT lovers as part of their new tourism campaign launch. Adding rainbow flags to the Virginia is for Lovers logo and launching a branded site for LGBT travelers to find friendly hotels, restaurants, and attractions. According to the Virginia Tourism Cooperation Corporation, LGBT vacation travelers spend more, stay longer, and go on more trips based on San Francisco-based Community Marketing, Inc., which would know, I assume. Is that stereotyping? Maybe. And this is amusing. The man who led the campaign for Out RVA, Kelly O'Keefe, Launched a campaign in 2014 that included full-page ads that read, Dear Atlanta, you know what it's like being in a southern city. People assume things about you, but I want to know, I want you to know the real me. The fact is, I'm gay. Love, Richmond, Virginia. I'm sure Virginia is more than happy to take all of the money that North Carolina is losing with their bathroom laws. So, we just need to make sure nothing like that ever happens here. And in marijuana news, Norfolk is on the cups of something after city council member recommended that they decriminalize marijuana. Um, a lot of good reporting on this coming out of Alt Daily. Our friends over there have been pushing this real hard. We've done a lot of work with Normal and our Virginia Marijuana Legalization Project over the past couple of years. Adam Eben out of Alexandria has pushed hard to get small amounts of pot decriminalized, changed from a criminal penalty to a civil one. Uh, it's been shot down past uh, two, two years at least. It, I believe it'll be up this winter in the General Assembly as well. But basically, uh, Virginia hasn't done anything with, with pot decriminalization. We spend $156 million a year, or give or take, uh, on prohibition enforcement and incarceration costs. There was a news release that came out this past week that stated that the number of arrests for marijuana possession are greater than all the other crimes combined. See if I can find that and link that in the show notes. But, you know, Colorado, most of the country's done it. Virginia, of course, conservative states. I think we have 19 states that currently have some form of uh, medical marijuana, legalized marijuana. And uh, Virginia, Virginia continues to lock up, you know, I think it was 25, 35,000 people a year for, you know, simple possession charges. Uh, article in the pilot. This past uh, few days, quoting Kenny Alexander, basically saying that he doesn't expect anything to happen through 2018, which would be past this upcoming session, the 2017 elections, 
and then the, the next session. So no change in Virginia's laws to pot policy until 2018. Now, whether or not Norfolk will do anything about it is a completely different subject. Apparently, all eight city council members say they for favor some form of decriminalization, but whether they're going to act on that remains to be seen at this time. They are discussing it and talking about it and taking their time, apparently. And uh, maybe something will come of it. I mean, the, my, my take on it is that we need to get all the cities involved to pressure the state legislator. I know Charlottesville has been involved with this in the past. You know, I, I don't see why the cities can't make a executive decision that cops won't prosecute it, DAs won't prosecute it. Um, I, I guess it's not just the city council with the state sheriffs and the chief of police and so forth that are involved in those decisions, but if we can call our city council representatives and our mayors and, and get them on this, that's how we're going to get this going. If there's pressure from the local localities, city governments, to get this issue taken care of, state representatives will fall in line. There's no doubt about it. But the, the political will isn't there right now and probably won't be through 20, 2018. I could really go into this subject all night probably. I've written thousands of words on it through vmlp.org, posting articles constantly on the Facebook page for it. The amount of resources that goes into it, the lives that are destroyed, you know, you lose your financial aid if you get arrested for it, you know, getting thrown in jail for 30 days, having to pay $500 fines for, you know, whatever. And then you have the hypocrisy of Governor McAuliffe at Farm Aid last month getting a picture taken with Willie Nelson while there's a can of his branded weed sitting right there on the table next to him. So if you're Willie Nelson, you know, it's cool. But if you're getting pulled over or somebody's raiding your house because you got a pot plant, you know, sorry. Anyways, I, I ran on this. I don't smoke. But there's no, there's no reason for us to keep fighting this failed war on drugs. Enough about weed. Let's get to it. Here's this week's shame. Let's do it. It's Trumptastic. What else can I say? I mean, like I promised in the intro, been trying to avoid it, stay out of it, but the past week, just the amount of sheer ugliness that has been going on, I can't ignore it anymore. I, it's a complete cluster. It's just completely insane what is happening. So, has the Trump campaign given up on Virginia? Probably. There's been, there was an article by the press, the Virginia pilot rather, earlier this week saying that the Trump campaign pulled out of Virginia. I think this actually followed Corey Stewart getting fired from the campaign for some uh, quote-unquote stunt that was pulled um, at GOP party headquarters earlier this week. There was some kind of protest because you know Trump basically imploded. The GOP rescinded their support, their canvassing efforts, their monetary support, and Corey basically went out there with a bunch of people that were protesting and called, uh, what did he call them, jerks? No, pukes. He called them pukes. Establishment, RNC establishment pukes who have worked their way into the Trump campaign. Um, so he got dumped right after that because apparently you don't upstage Trump or, or whatever. Um, so right after this happened, there was a report that the Trump campaign was pulling out. Uh, John Fredericks, who's the co-chair of uh, AM radio host in Chesapeake, um, was on the air all morning the following day, just denying, denying, denying. Um, I was actually driving back from Virginia Beach, and 
the Trump victory bus. Uh, I pulled up behind on the interstate and drove, got stuck behind it for probably about 15 minutes before I could pass it. But I tell you what, I I had to try real hard to not ram it. I told my friends I wish I had laser blasters on my car so I could blow it up. But anyways, but the entire GOP establishment in the state of Virginia is just completely falling apart over this. Um, I believe no House of Delegates or General Assembly member has disowned Trump or unendorsed Trump over his sexist comments, uh, sexual assault comments, rather. Let's call it what it is. And uh, it's just that's just really sad. Um, the Trump campaign rolled out a leadership list this month, <laughs> and uh, Democrats were all over it. Uh, who, who, some of the names on here, Rob Bell, Dave Bratt, uh, delegate and congressman, who else here? Randy Forbes, Congress, former congressman, well, he's still a congressman, but he's going to be a former congressman. Several delegates, we'll put the full list up there, Frank Wagner, state senator, Rob Whitman, congressman. Um, I think Barbara Comstock, who's congressional candidate, I, I don't I can't remember which which district it is, but she basically is in a real tight race, and she had to disown him. Uh, Want to get into meta commentary on the race? I think a lot of people were looking for excuses to dump him based on you know his debate performances and everything else that was going on, and the the tapes, the Trump tapes, hashtag Trump tapes. Uh, gave gave them an excuse to bail out, and so Comstock was was definitely one of those people that threw him to the curb. I don't know if she's reendorsed him by now or not, but um, you know it's been it, the, the polls between Clinton and Trump have been up and down, up and down the past you know since the conventions ended, and and now I think it's so bad that they've just given up and they're moving on trying to hold on to Utah or some other insanely normal normally conservative state where it just should just be a washout but because he's just so toxic it's like they're losing everywhere i mean i don't i don't think there's any doubt that clinton's going to win this thing um knock on wood anyways but you know i i posted something yet last night i was up till 12:30 responding to some post I, wall post i saw it's just so ugly it's just so ugly like you know, the GOP has been talking about Clinton for the past 35 years, talking about all this damage that she's done. I mean, you know, Benghazi, Libya, the emails, uh, you know, what else? Like, they, they talk about all this damage that she's done, but, but look at what has happened since Trump became the nominee. Hell, look at what has happened since... These tapes came out. Here's an example. You've got a you've got an article in a Daily Progress about Jane Dittmar's campaign office in Flavana County about some Donald Trump guy with a gun sitting out in his pickup truck outside of the Flavana office of Miss Dittmar, just sitting there with his guns and his Trump signs, not doing nothing. I mean, this follows Trump's calls to go out to certain places, quote unquote, and you know, make sure the right people aren't voting or, or the right, yeah, the right people aren't voting. You know, voter intimidation, all this other stuff. I mean, it's just insane. It's insane. And and this is rich. The Norman, Tommy Norman, Williamsburg Senate Majority Leader, said. When asked for comments on Trump's tapes, sexual bragging of sexual assault, Norman said, quote, the matter was over my pay grade. That's your Senate Majority GOP leadership just standing by as this guy just wrecks the country, scorched earth all the way down. It's so ugly. It's just so ugly. And the sad thing is, even if we win, even when we win in November, 
we're here less than 100 days left of the Obama presidency. So in 100 days when Clinton is president, God help us, we're still going to have to deal with all these Trump supporters and all of this ugliness. I mean, say the Republican Party splits into two and the Senate gets one, we win the Senate and we win back you know, a couple of seats in the House. I mean, can you imagine Hillary Clinton... Majority Senate, majority Democrat Senate, like, people are going to go nuts. Once she starts appointing Supreme Court justices, like, he's just lowered, Trump has lowered the ball so far in the past year, year and a half, I don't know. The racism, the sexism, the xenophobia, the slut shaming, the fat shaming, and people... And, and his defenders, I, this was my defense last night to this person who was talking about, so so what if Donald Trump called somebody fat? At least he's not Hillary Clinton. Those people have lost all sense of moral authority that they might have attempted to claim in the past. It goes back to this Delegate Morris guy who put up all these laws to protect the unborn, you know, fetal pain bills and all this other stuff. Protect the unborn, and then go and allegedly beat your kid, beat your wife. Oh, I don't care what a person says in private. Who doesn't say crazy stuff in private? Well, you know what? You're running for public office. You need to be a little more careful. And when Trump crosses the line between talking about it and bragging about sexual assault, and then all these women come out of the woodwork, it just infuriates me. As a person, not as a father of two girls and son of a mother and husband to a wife. As a person, it infuriates me. I mean, the whole thing has made me question a lot of my behavior over the past, my adult life, basically. But, you know, locker room talk and all this stuff. I mean, we got to talk about this stuff. But I, I really think that this election has turned into a referendum on rape culture. And sexism. And I think that Trump trotting out Paula Jones and these other women who accused Bill Clinton of rape, all this stuff needs to be revisited at some point. But trying to justify Trump's behavior by pointing a finger at Bill Clinton and Hillary standing by her man, or even the accusations of attacking the accusers. That's all stuff we'll need to come back to, but golly, if this man hasn't lit himself on fire. Speaking of fire, GOP leaders are calling to fire Virginia's election chiefs, and this still ties into Trump. This is, this is why I can't not talk about this anymore. He's, he's a winner, and if he loses, it's because it's rigged by crooked Hillary. And he's already trying to claim that you know, if he loses, it's because the game has been rigged. And, you know, unfortunately, the Democrats really haven't given them any, don't, don't really have any ground to stand on based on all of the accusations and the evidence that we're seeing out of the Nevada primaries and elsewhere around the country where Bernie versus Hillary. I mean, I, I, I can't even talk about that stuff because it would probably just make me physically ill to talk about it you know trying to fight that while we're trying to fight the GOP nom I think it can wait I I really think once Hillary is elected she's going to be the most criticized president we've ever had not only by the right wing but the left wing as well she's going to rule as a moderate she's going to get it from both sides uh, Warren's already said that you know if, if she doesn't if Elizabeth Warren has already said that if Hillary Clinton doesn't put the right people in cabinet secretary positions, that she's going to fight her. And I think all the Bernie Kratz and all these people that have come into the political process as a result of that, I think they're going to do the same thing. So Hillary needs to watch herself on the CPP, on corporate cronyism, Wall Street, Syria, and all this other stuff. I think she's going to have a real hard time. 
But, I mean, obviously, if there's anybody that can walk that line, I'm sure it's her. But back to this article from the Daily Press, Travis Fain. Fire elections, fire Virginia's election chief. So Trump's talking about it's rigged, it's rigged. So the GOP Trump supporters are all right there in line with them saying, yeah, we've got problems with our election integrity. You know, all these hacks from Russian actors and et cetera, et cetera. Delegate Tim Hugo, chairman of the House Republican Caucus, said during a lengthy legislative hearing on election logistics that Governor McAuliffe should replace Virginia Department of Elections Commissioner Edgardo Cortez quickly with competent and nonpartisan leadership. No one else joined in calling for Cortez's job. Hmm. To call into question my personal integrity is beyond the pale, said Cortez. It was a five and a half hour hearing earlier this week. Um, I'm supposed to talk to somebody this after this evening about what went on there, but I know Delegate Marcia Price had a statement that she pushed out about that. The Joint Committee, dominated by Republicans, heard a report alleging that potentially thousands of non citizens are illegally registered to vote in Virginia. Much of that port report has been debunked, of course. And Democrats questioned the timing and tone of the entire hearing, saying it fit a narrative GOP presidential nominee Donald Trump has tried to build in recent weeks. That if he doesn't win, the election was rigged. Well, that was our shame. Let's have some fame. This week's fame goes to Liberty University students for distancing themselves from Trump following a just disgusting move by University President Jerry Falwell Jr. in support of Trump after the so-mentioned Trump tapes. A group calling themselves Liberty United Against Trump made a statement declaring their disassociation from the Republican nominee. 24 hours later, they had collected 2,100 virtual signatures toward their cause. Quote, We are Liberty students who are disappointed with President Falwell's endorsement and are tired of being associated with one of the worst presidential candidates in American history. Donald Trump does not represent our values and we want nothing to do with him. Well said. Well said. Quote, it hasn't been a reaction to anything specific, just the many deplorable things Donald Trump has said. The signatures collected represent a small percentage of the Liberty student body, which is 15,000 resident students and 90,000 online students. So we'll see how that takes off. Um, You know... I'm glad. I mean, Liberty's right here in my backyard out in Virginia Beach. Um, They've got a great restaurant, though. Man, their brunch over there, great. But, gosh. Anyways. And we're going to wrap up tonight with some good news out of Manassas, Virginia, which traditionally has one candidate running for city council even though they have three open seats. The Northern Virginia city of 16,000 residents now has multiple candidates vying for each seat on November 8th. So there are seven write-in candidates along with a Democrat whose name will appear on the ballot. The top three vote-getters will be elected to the seven-member council. So voter apathy turns into interest. This is what we like to see. We like to see people getting out there getting active, running for office. That's what drives Progressive House Virginia. That's the message that Sanders has urged people to heed. That's the message we're trying to get out here every week with these podcasts and what we're doing with For Virginia. So glad that things are turning around in Manassas. Hopefully we will see more activity coming out. Uh, We did see uh, an announcement on Facebook today for a candidate for the 51st delegate seat. 
Mr. Kinney Allen Bodie, B O D D Y E, Body, Kinney Body, Kinney, you can send me a message if I'm pronouncing that wrong. I'll read you a little bit about his statement. He says, My decision to run is deeply rooted in my desire to improve the lives of everyone who lives in my district, but also everyone throughout Virginia. I have long supported various politic politicians and causes through both time and donations, and I feel as if I must take the next step and get involved in our political process directly. Bravo, Kenny. We look forward to talking to you and helping you and seeing what you're all about and encouraging other people to get involved as well. That's all the time we've got for this week, folks. Appreciate everyone that tuned in. Thank you for, for your support and all your shares. Please check our website, share us on social media, and your financial support is always appreciated. This is the For Virginia Podcast, Episode 9. Submit your feedback through Facebook or by emailing info at forvirginia.org. We'll continue working hard to bring you the news, information, and analysis to help keep the progressive revolution moving forward in Virginia through 2017. My name is Michael Brandon Wade. Thank you, and we'll see you again next week. Bye.